All right, today we want to do more examples of Taylor series, and we also want to look at a couple of applications that are important kinds of applications that you might see. And so I first want to just start off by going through some homework problems that you had from section 10.3, just to make sure that you understood what to do. Start with number three, which was to expand the function square root of one minus two X as a Taylor series, not by going back to the definition of taking derivatives, F prime, F double prime, F triple prime, F quadruple prime, et cetera, but instead by using a known series. And when you involve square roots or cube roots or one over square roots, the first thing you should think of is a binomial series. You wanna to try to write this as something to a power in fact, ideally one plus something to a power. And that can be certainly done here. P is one half. That would be the P for a binomial series. What will play the role that X did in the binomial series for null? It's not X itself. What will play the role of X here? Go ahead. Negative 2x. Think of 1 minus 2x is 1 plus negative 2x. Now use the formula for the binomial series. I'll remind you what it is. Here it is. 1 plus x to the p, where x is any old number. So effectively, in our problem, negative 2x represents any old number, at least between negative 1 and 1. You get this expression, 1 plus px plus p times p minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 over 3 factorial times x cubed, et cetera. As long as the thing playing the role of x is between negative 1 and 1, this will work. And that's what we do here. Negative 2x plays the role of x. p is 1 half. So this becomes 1 plus p times the thing that plays the role of x, which is negative 2x plus p times p minus 1 over 2 factorial times the thing playing the role of x quantity squared plus p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 over 3 factorial times the thing playing the role of x quantity cubed, et cetera. As I always say, don't forget your plus dot dot dots. By the way, I forgot to tell the graders to make sure you include the plus dot dot dots. So you may have gotten away with it on homework, but on tests, if I say I want the series expansion, I want to see the plus dot dots, dot dot dots to emphasize that the pattern goes on forever. To truly say these are equal for all X in the interval of convergence, you need to have the plus dot dot dots there. Otherwise it's just an approximation. And what is the interval of convergence? Again, the thing playing the role of x, in this case, negative 2x has to be between negative 1 and 1. Or if you prefer, the absolute value of that quantity has to be less than 1. The absolute value of negative 2x is the same as the absolute value of negative 2 times the absolute value of x. And that's positive 2. So this is the same as saying the absolute value of x itself is less than 1 half. That's the interval of convergence. Int of converge. Int, un, int of conv means interval of convergence. Since the interval is centered at zero, the number that's over there is the same as the radius of convergence. But if the interval is not centered at zero, though we've done very few examples of such things, then the number over there is not the same as the radius. Um, excuse me. It is the same as the radius. However, if you figure out the endpoints, those are not the same as the radius. So you, it's, it's typically a good thing to draw the picture of the interval of convergence. In this case, from negative one half to positive one half, not including the endpoints. For all the numbers in that interval, this series converges. It also happens to turn out to equal the function, though that takes more proof. 
And the radius of convergence is the distance between the center and either endpoint. R is one half. You were not asked for the interval convergence or the radius, but I might in the test. So I wanted to add that. Next problem I want to do is number four. And that was to figure out the series for cosine of theta squared. You can look in the book if you want, section 10.3. Cosine of theta squared. What is that series? The point is to use the series for cosine of x and just replace the x with theta squared. Here's the series for cosine of x. Therefore, the series for cosine of theta squared just replaces each x with theta squared. And then it is a good idea, and you should certainly be able to do this if I ask you to simplify. I mean, it's in a sense, it's nice to have the factorials there as well, so you see the pattern, but you should be able to simplify with those exponents, you have to multiply them. Two times two is four with the next one. Two times four is eight. With the next one, two times six is 12. You can always check your answers with Mathematica. Let's do that quickly for these first two examples. So the first example, I will show you what, you what I was just writing down there if you didn't quite get it written down. I'll show you again here in a second. First example is square root of one minus two X. I'm looking for at least the third degree term. And Mathematica will, will simplify it. So we should get, uh, well, I guess I forgot to simplify, didn't I? Okay, let's simplify. Sorry about that. Let's simplify this first example. One minus uh, X, right? One half times negative two is negative one. With the next one, I get a two, negative two squared is positive four. This is gonna give me a negative one eighth. So ultimately minus one half X squared. With the next one here, negative two cubed is negative eight. Two other minus signs means I continue having a minus sign. Uh, I've got three twos there, eight and one eighth will cancel. The three cancels with one of those threes. It looks like we're getting another minus one half here. And probably that minus sign continues the pattern. Looks like that's what it simplifies to. Um, I don't think it continues to be minus one half but the minus sign itself continues. Let's go higher degree here. Yeah, the numbers do not continue to be one, negative one half, but they are all minus signs after the first term. We have just confirmed this part here. The other example, Can I get a theta in there? Sure, escape th escape makes the theta if you like. You don't, not that you have to put a theta, but. And I wanna see at least through the 12th degree term. So put a 12 there. Yep, looks good. Next example, number seven. T sine of three T. Use the series for sine. Use the fact that sine of X is X minus X cubed over three factorial plus X to the fifth over five factorial minus X to the seventh over seven factorial, et cetera. So here replace each X with three T. If 
et cetera. Simplify, distribute the t through. So you get three t squared. Let's go ahead and try to simplify all these fractions. <clears throat> three cubes, 27 divided by six is nine halves. T cubed times T is T to the fourth. We're only gonna get even powers with this example. This is actually gonna be an even function is what that'll end up meaning. Three to the fifth is 243 divided by five factorial divided by 120. Both of those are divisible by three. This simplifies to 81 fortieths t to the fifth times t is t to the sixth. Three to the seventh. Three to the seventh is 2,187. Seven factorial is 5,040. 2,187 divided by 5,040. It turns out both of those are divisible by nine. 2187 divided by nine is 243. And 5040 divided by nine is not that. 560. So the fraction reduces to this and, and those have no common factors anymore. T to the seventh times T is T to the eighth. We'll check that in a second as well. But let me just say also that in both of these examples, the interval of convergence is the entire real number one. This is true for all x. Theta squared is playing the role of x. This is true for all theta squared, which means it's also true for all theta. The interval of convergence is the entire real number line, which you could write with interval notation like this. Or if you like doing this, you can use a sort of a fancy looking R to specify the real number system. You could also say the radius of convergence is infinity. When I write those things, I'm not saying infinity is a number. It's just shorthand notation to say it converges for all X. That's true as well for this problem. This is true for all T. because that equation is true for all x. If x is an arbitrary real number, then effectively 3t is an arbitrary real number. So t itself is an arbitrary real number. That makes sense? 3t can be thought of as arbitrary. It doesn't matter what it is, and therefore it doesn't matter what t is. Now let's go ahead and check that one too. Series for t times sine 3t through at least the eighth power. Looks good. Okay. Can I clarify anything? All right, the rest of the day today, what we want to do are some, first of all, some harder examples. couple of which are going to be related to some applications. And then we want to start the next section, which will be our last section before the exam next Monday. I do have some old exams up on Moodle. You can start working on those if you like. Um, I also made a, an exam re review video, actually not recently, but a couple of years ago, I made an exam two review video. I'll share that with you as well. The first harder problem that I want to do here is actually problem number 24 in section 10.3. <clears throat> the function is f of x equals a over square root of a squared plus x squared, where a is positive and constant. And if you look at the book's directions on this problem, they say to expand this function as a series, not in just plain powers of X, but powers of X over A. 
We're going to see an application of this kind of thing today still as well. Not this exact same function, but something somewhat similar related actually to Einstein's theory of relativity. We'll see something similar to this. So it'll be good to get a little practice right now. Write this as a series. in terms of, they call it the variable x over a, and you, you certainly can call something like that a variable if you like. Though if, if you did, did, you might want to give it a different name, like u or something, kind of like a substitution. But you don't have to introduce a new letter. You can just keep the x over a in there. And once again, the way to do this is not to use the derivatives. That's going to get too messy. Instead, use the same formula we used with the first example, binomial series, because you see a square root. This time it's in the denominator, but that's OK. Instead of a positive 1 half power, it's a negative 1 half power. So the P here is going to be negative one half. However, careful, the formula we use from the book expands one plus something to the P power, not a squared plus something to the P power. So I need a one there instead. So we need to do a little algebra trickery again. We need to factor out that A squared so that there's not a one there. But if you do that, you got to compensate. Instead of x squared, you'd have x squared over a squared. Or since we want terms that involve powers of x over a, it might be best to write it as x over a quantity squared. You got to practice these things if you're going to get better, okay? Maybe even go beyond the regular homework problems and practice a couple other problems like this. You're trying to use the binomial series formula. You're trying to rearrange with some tricky algebra so that you can do that. Because I see a one plus something. And ultimately, it'll be raised to the negative one half power because I can distribute that negative one half power through to both factors to be powers of both the a squared and the one plus x over a squared. This simplifies, you can multiply those exponents, two times negative one half is negative one, is negative one. And then a times a to the negative one is a to the zero, this is a one. It's simplified pretty nicely. It's not a guarantee that that will always happen. Again, here's the P. Use the binomial series formula now. You get one plus P times X. Well, what, whatever's playing the role of X, excuse me. P is negative one half, so I get a minus one half. What's playing the role of X this entire thing, including the square? x over a quantity squared plus p times p minus 1 over 2 factorial times the thing playing the role of x quantity cubed or squared excuse me like that and actually the book just requests the first three non-zero terms instead of the first four non-zero terms so i will stop there but don't forget the plus dot dot dots and now simplify, and I could certainly square these fraction, this fraction to get x squared over a squared. But because we want this, the series in terms of x over a, I'm actually going to leave this first term as is. I'm not going to simplify it at all because of how the problem is phrased. With the next term, 
simplify this. Two negatives make a positive. You get positive, looks like three eighths ultimately. Here you have to multiply those, those exponents x over a to the fourth power. And probably the next one is a minus sign. So I'll put a minus sign right next to it. What's the interval of convergence? This converges if the thing playing the role of x has an absolute value less than one. Question? It would not be wrong. Um, I'm trying to go more with the book spirit of writing it in terms of powers of x over a. Right. Yeah. Converges if the absolute value of the thing playing the role of the x with this, which is this entire thing, x over a squared is less than one. That's not as nasty to figure out and simplify as it looks. For one thing, if the square of a number has an absolute value less than one, the number itself has got an absolute value less than one. Does that make sense? I mean, 0.9 squared is 0.81. Negative 0.9 squared is 0.81. The square of some number is less than one in absolute value. That means the number itself has to be one less than one in absolute value. The absolute value of a fraction like this is the corresponding ratio of the absolute values. And then I can multiply both sides by the absolute value of A. A is fixed here. That's a constant. In fact, this is the radius of convergence. That's the R, including the absolute value signs. Actually, A was positive, so I don't even need absolute value signs there. But it doesn't hurt to put them there. The interval of convergence goes from negative A to positive A, not including the endpoints. And the radius is A. Let's see if Mathematica can confirm this answer. I actually know from the previous class that it does. However, it doesn't write the answer in the nicest form. In part because it's not going to, it's not making particular assumptions about the value of A. So you can see, first of all, the coefficients are correct. Um, a is positive, so the absolute or the square root of a squared is a itself. In general, it's the absolute value of a. So this is really an a over a here, which is one, matching our one. Then I get a coefficient of negative one half here, just like I have a coefficient of negative one half there. What about the a? I got an a divided by a squared to the three halves power. You can multiply those exponents to get a cubed on the bottom. And a divided by a cubed is one over a squared, matching the what I'd get if I expanded this to be an a squared. Then I have a plus three eighths, just like I did by hand. And also a cubed times a effectively is a to the fourth. What's the value of this? Well, certainly this was not hard as hard to justify 50, 60, 70 years ago or more than as it is now. Because back in the olden days, and certainly back when Newton was around 350 years ago, he wanted to approximate functions involving square roots, and he didn't have any technology. These series representations were very useful. Not only did they equal the original function on the interval of convergence, but if I truncate, if I use a <clears throat> Taylor polynomials, they are good approximations when x is, in this case, close to 0. And I can get better and better approximations by taking higher and higher degrees. And that can be done by hand without technology, because it only involves arithmetic 
addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Newton did have our decimal system. Our decimal, decimal system is called the Hindu Arabic decimal system, base 10 was brought over to Europe around a thousand something years ago. Newton lived 350 years ago or so. So he had the decimal system. He could do arithmetic fine, no problem. What's harder is square roots. With all our technology, this now feels harder to justify. I will tell you that you can apply these things certainly with differential equations, which we're going to start talking about after the exam next week apply series to differential equations. That's kind of a higher level application. It's also useful to use these series to think about the behavior of functions as kind of a higher level application. So for example, I mean, I could graph this. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to graph it with Mathematica. But can I understand why the graph looks the way that it does? Let's do that here. I'll make it and manipulate so I can change the parameter A. Graph it for x values near zero. Let's let a start out small like 0.1 and go to say 10. What am I going to see? Well, I happen to know because I did it last section, but that, before that, I didn't know for sure. I, I could have guessed it though. Here's what I see, kind of like a bell curve. It's not the true bell curve, which by the way, we're about to talk about for another application here in a few minutes. That's what the graph of this function looks like as a function of x. And then because I put it in a manipulate, I can change the value of a and see how the graph changes. As a increases, the graph gets more horizontal. Why? Why does that happen? The series can explain it. How? I could, for example, use a quadratic approximation to the function and see that the quadratic approximations graph behaves in the exact same way that I just showed you. That quadratic approximation, if I only use those first two terms and say simplify it like this, I see that as a quadratic function in X with a y-intercept of one, the, the y-intercept there stayed the same no matter what A is. That y-intercept is always the same. And as a increases, what's going to happen to this coefficient of x squared? Well, it's always negative. As a gets bigger and bigger, 1 over 2a squared is going to get smaller and smaller towards 0. a is 10. 10 squared is 100. 2 times 100 is 200. This is 1 200th when a is 10. That's a parabola that is very flat. And when a is small, like 0.1, this becomes a big coefficient, and you get a skinny parabola. When a is small, it's a skinny parabola. When a is large, it's a wider parabola. Now, the, the function itself, the main function, is not truly a parabola. I'm only talking about the approximation to the quadratic term being a parabola. Let's go ahead and copy and paste this here and graph it at, at the same time here. This goldish colored graph is a parabola, no matter what A is. It's a good approximation to the blue graph near zero. The blue graph is not a parabola, but it's behaving similar to, parabola, to a parabola near zero. So that's kind of a higher level application is to help you understand why the function is behaving the way it does, to some degree at least. Not a full understanding, it's just a understanding near x equals zero in this case. Let's look at a couple applications that you could say are a little bit more, um, I suppose you could call them more important applications. First application I want to look at is related to probability and statistics. Remember PDFs, probability density functions. Oh boy, final exam is cumulative. You don't want to completely hit the clear button. PDFs like 
the normal distribution bell-shaped curve are used to find probabilities by integrating them to find areas remember that and the standard normal distribution has a formula similar to this function not exactly the same e to the negative x squared it's not exactly the same but to keep things simple let me just think about this function what is the pdf the probability density function of a standard normal i can have mathematica computed for me pdf normal distribution zero is the mean and one is called the standard deviation there's its true formula it's not a negative x squared in the exponent it's a negative x squared over two and we also have to divide by square root of two pi the graph of this is called the standard normal distribution the standard bell-shaped curve it's also called a gaussian looks like this And yeah, integrating this thing is important for applications of probability and statistics. And by the way, statistics has applications in every area of life. Not that everybody applies statistics, but in theory, you could. I kind of joke, even if you end up being, uh, if your job ends up being like a sports mascot, you can still apply statistics. Because what can you do? You can analyze other sports mas mascots and keep track of how well they do at shooting things into the crowd, for example, and bring a report to your boss and say, hey, I deserve a raise. Look at how much better than I'm doing than such and such a mascot, who I know is getting such a salary, right? Okay, you can, in theory, apply statistics to any area of life. What if we wanted to find the value of this integral? If we did it with a standard normal function, PDF, it would be, it would represent the probability that the variable is between zero and one. And I can certainly do that in Mathematica. Although if I want a numerical approximation, I need to do like slash slash capital N. It's about a 34% chance that the variable is going to be between zero and one if the standard normal distribution is a good model. What if I didn't put the slash slash capital in? ERF. We've seen that before, right? ERF stands for error function. What's going on there? You cannot represent an antiderivative of this function in terms of elementary functions. What are elementary functions? They're all the functions you've all ever learned to this point, except for things like ERF. However, we can still approximate this integral, even if we don't know values of ERF, even if we don't use technology. How? With infinite series. I mean, we could also approximate it, of course, with numerical integration like Simpson's rule. But to tell you the truth, infinite series is more fun. Use the series for e to the x and replace x with negative x squared. Right? The series for e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, et cetera. That's true for all x. <clears throat> Something you should remember to your dying day, ideally. Okay. You know, I, I joke that if you will go to a cocktail party in 50 years and somebody says, hey, you remember calculus? Remember the series for e to the x? Wasn't, it, wasn't that cool? You should not feel embarrassed and say, sorry, I don't, I don't remember. You, you should try to remember that that's what it is. It's, it's a cultural thing, really. I'm serious. Everybody should know the series for e to the x, even if they don't know much math. Okay, yes, that's my implicit bias, but that's my opinion. We can write this integral as the integral of an infinite series. 
and then integrate term by term. If I was doing an indefinite integral, I could do a plus C, though the C doesn't matter for definite integrals. As a definite integral, you don't need a plus C. Just integrate, get an X plus one half X squared plus two times three is six. So we get one sixth X cubed plus one twenty fourth X to the fourth. Hmm. Oh, I, you know, I made a mistake, didn't I? Sorry. I made a bad mistake. Cross all that out. Is that your question, David? No, I was going to point out that um, if you add multiple, you end up with the same term. So uh, this is actually not that. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was noticing. This is like e to the x, except without a minus, without a 1 at the beginning. Interesting. How oh, the integral of e to the x is e to the x. Okay, I made a mistake though. I needed to replace x with negative x squared. I forgot to do that. So replace each x with negative x squared. Let's simplify before we integrate. Now, yes, integrate term by term. If we plug in zero, we get zero. Plug in one, we can represent the integral, the final answer as one minus a third plus a tenth minus a 42nd, et cetera. And then we could truncate it at any spot we want to find an approximation. This is a 40 second here. Truncate, for example, at minus one over 42 to find an approximation. Let's go ahead and see how good it is. There's the exact answer to six decimal places. Here's our approximation. Yeah, pretty good. If I want better approximation, I include more terms. Let's try including one more term. Uh, what would the next term be? I'd be integrating, what would it be? It'd be x to the eighth power over uh, pi factorial over 120. So I get an x to the ninth power over 120 times nine. One over 120 times nine would be 1,080. It's closer, not as much closer as I expected. Did I do that right? Oh, I, I, did I make a mistake? I, I must have made a mistake. Uh, well, maybe not. I, I'm, I'm not positive that this is right for the next term, but. I actually expected it to be a bit bigger than the true answer. It's closer, but it's not bigger. So I think maybe I did something wrong. I'll try to fix it after class. I'll, I'll, by the way, I will try to share today's notebook with you. Uh, if somebody could send me a reminder, that'd be great. So you can have all these calculations there to see. All right, um, two more things to do. First thing is a physics application.
related to relativity. It's problem 55 in section 10.3. I'm going to assign a different problem related to relativity. I'm going to assign number 57. 55 says, when an object of length L0 is moving at speed V, the theory of relativity, in other words, what was created by Einstein, predicts that the object appears to have a different length L. What? How is that possible? That's what relativity predicts. Is relativity right? It actually is. It's called length dilation. There's also something called time dilation. And there's also something called mass dilation. Your problem is about mass dilation. How could the length change? It's the length relative to an observer. That's how it changes. Think of it this way. Imagine you're standing on the ground down near SpaceX's launch pad. You see the rocket on the uh, be about to lift off and somehow you're able to measure its height or you know its height. Lifts off into outer space, starts orbiting the Earth really, really fast. Actually, if you were orbiting the Earth really, really fast, you'd probably go flying out into deep space, but pretend it doesn't. And you see it going around the Earth, you see it coming by again, and somehow you're through your tel telescope, telescope able to measure the length of that rocket, ignoring any stages that have fallen off. Pretend no stages have fallen off. It's going to look shorter to you than it does to the person in the rocket if they were somehow able to measure the length, maybe by walking back and forth from the front to the back or something. OK, this is a thought experiment. Can anybody literally do those things? I don't know. It will look shorter. It will be measured to be shorter from your perspective compared to the other person. Time dilation has practical importance. That's length dilation. Time dilation has practical importance. Did you, did you know about that? The fact that time moves slower for people who are moving faster than it does for an observer of those people. Uh, that has important applications like to GPS. If GPS satellites did not take time dilation into account, everything would be off in terms of being able to keep track of where you are, for example. And measuring time correctly. So you, it's been proven that all this stuff works. The equation that relates L and L0 is what you see there. Part A, does the, ob the moving object appear longer or shorter than the rest length L0? In other words, is L bigger or smaller than L0? You don't need series to figure that out. Can you just look at that equation and, and see what the answer is? Would L be bigger or smaller than L0? This is a worthwhile skill to have when you read science books. It's not just the equations themselves that are important, it's how to think about them. Would this equation apply that L is bigger or smaller than L0? Smaller. Can you give a reason? That's true. Yep, this is positive. Yep. Yeah, this thing under the square root is less than one. The square root of a number less than one is still less than one. L0 times a number less than one is smaller than L0. L is smaller than L0. It's a good thing to be able to think about equations that you see in science, text, science textbooks like that. Of course, you might wonder what happens if B gets too big? Because then you have a square root of a negative number. Does that mean L becomes imaginary? The answer is no. The resolution to that is you can't go past the speed of light. C is the speed of light. So B can't be bigger than C. So you don't you never end up subtracting something bigger than one here. C is the speed of light. So you can answer part A without doing series. Part B says expand as a series in V over C. Just like before, we expanded a series in x over a.
Now let's expand this series. This function is a series in V over C. L equals L zero square root of one minus V over C squared. And that is a good thing to be able to do. To expand it in terms of V over C because when people think about this kind of equation, typically V is large enough that it's a significant fraction of the speed of light. We typically think about this as having a significant effect when V is large enough to be a certain fraction of the speed of light. And what do I mean by significant? Well, even 1% of the speed of light is significant. Speed of light is super fast. I hope you know that. That's something everybody should know as well. 186,000 miles a second, a second, not an hour. It's like 300,000 kilometers a second. A light beam can go around the earth like seven times in one second. That's how fast it goes. Seven times in one second. It took the astronauts 50 years ago, three days maybe to get to the moon in a spaceship going 25,000 miles an hour. It takes a light beam like a second and a half. How long does it take the light from the sun to get to the earth? The sun's about 93 million miles away. Yeah, six, maybe seven or eight, I'm not sure. You can look it up. The nearest star, however, is four light years away. That's really far because light takes four years to get here from that star. Four years, even though it's going around the earth fast enough to go seven times a second, if it were going around the earth. Yet it takes four years to get here from the nearest star. The nearest star is really, really far away, which means other stars are much, much further away. The scale of the universe is almost incomprehensible. <sighs> so what's the first thing I did here? I'm trying to use the binomial series. There's my P. I also want one plus something, not one minus something. So I changed that to a plus sign and compensated by putting a minus sign there. Don't put that minus sign inside the parentheses. That would be bad because then you'd be squaring the whole thing and the minus sign would go away. So you need that minus sign outside those parentheses right there. You got to be really careful. Leave the L0 out in front. Use the binomial series with P equal to 1 half. 1 plus P times the thing playing the role of the X, which is this entire thing. Right here, that's the entire thing playing the role of the X, including the minus sign. Then plus P times one minus, or times P minus one, excuse me, over two factorial, times the thing playing the role of the X, quantity squared, et cetera. I'll, I won't do any more than that. Simplify. We're trying to get this as a power series in V over C, so I will leave those fractions unsimplified. I will not bother squaring that. I will multiply those exponents to get a fourth power there. And I bet the minus signs pattern here does continue. I'll just assume it does. That's OK. You can also multiply the L0 through. <clears throat> and notice the fact that we do have all minus signs there does emphasize, once again, that when V is positive, L is smaller than L0, because we're taking L0 minus a bunch of positive quantities. These things in the denominators, by the way, are all C's, not, not L's or anything. C is the speed of light. And yeah, if v, if, for example, V is 10% of the speed of light, then V over C would be 0.1 C over C, 0.1. If V is 20% of the speed of light, then V over C would be 0.2 C over C, 0.2. If you're thinking in terms of percentages of the speed of light, these fractions become particular decimals. 
So that's part B. Part C says, or C is a little silly, it feels. If the object's moving very slowly, approximate L using one term of the series. Interpret the result in terms of moving objects. If V is very small, approximately zero, then this equation says L is approximately L zero, which means if you're going slowly, there's not much difference between the length that you observe versus the length that an outside observer observes. I guess that's good to know. So you don't really need the series to have guessed that. You could say if V is close to zero, but a bit bigger, <laughs> this is not very precise, but a bit bigger, maybe we'd want the second degree term as a better approximation. Maybe we want to do that. And maybe we want to analyze something based on that. <clears throat> How much is a bit bigger? That could still be a, a fairly fast speed, like 10% of the speed of light. If, if V over C, for example, is 0.1, meaning V is 10% of the speed of light, this implies L is approximately L0 minus one half L0 times 0.1 squared. That's L0 minus 0.1 squared is 0 0.01 and half of that is 0 0.005. This is telling you something useful. If you're going 10% of the speed of light, the length contraction is by about a factor of one half of 1%. The observed length of some of an outside observer is 99.5% of your observed length if you're actually in the spaceship. That's that's a that's a typical way this might be used. <clears throat> 